In this video, I'm going to explain how you work out whether a proprietary right in land is either legal or equitable. If you're just starting to study land law, this is probably one of the first things you'll come across. As your studies progress, you'll begin to see why this issue is so extremely important in land law. If you're watching the video in order to consolidate and check your understanding, so perhaps you're preparing for an exam, for example, you'll know that it's a very important question. And if you get it wrong, it can have a significant impact on the accuracy of an exam or coursework answer. So I'm going to show you how to work it out by breaking it down into steps. And we're going to be looking at the Law of Property Act 1925, Section 1. So why is it so important to know whether a property right in land is legal or equitable? Well, property rights in or over land attach to the land itself, and so they can pass with the land when ownership changes. And the basic reason we need to know whether that property right is legal or equitable boils down to the fact that an equitable right is more vulnerable when the land is sold. As we will see, although the rules to create an equitable right are generally more flexible and less rigid than those needed to create a legal right, an equitable right is not always enforceable against a new owner of the land. And as you continue your studies, you will see that the person who has the benefit of an equitable right very often has to take active steps to protect their right against new landowners. So if you have already studied the system of registered and unregistered title, then you will know that the right might need to be protected as either a land charge, if it's unregistered land, or as a notice or restriction where the title is registered. Most of the exam questions I've come across include one or more of the property rights from this list. So these are the ones that I'm going to concentrate on. There are other rights, for example, a charge for inheritance tax. The owner of these rights will in practice be some form of government agency. However, they don't usually come up in undergraduate exams, so I'm going to leave those on one side for today. So before we start looking at this topic in a bit more detail, here's a brief overview. And what we will see is that there are some types of property rights which can be either legal or equitable. And there are other types of rights which can only ever be equitable, so they can never be legal. So to put it another way, there are some property rights which cannot ever be legal. They will always be equitable. So on this slide, I've set out the different property rights. And in the red column, we have rights which can either be legal or equitable. And in the green column, we have rights which can only ever be equitable. So they can't be legal. But unless you plan to remember them all, what you need to know is how to work it out. It puts less pressure on you in the exam because there's less to remember. And much more importantly, when answering a question on third party rights and their enforceability, your grade will be better because you will get credit for showing how you've arrived at your conclusion. Law is like a maths exam. You have to show you're working out. So to work it out, there are two key questions you need to ask and ask them in this order. First, is this right capable of being legal? And second, how was the right created? Or to put it another way, can this type of right be legal? Because some property rights can only ever be equitable. And if yes, it can be legal. Is this particular property right legal? So just because this type of right is capable of being legal, doesn't mean that this particular one is. So, for example, if you have a right of way, this is a form of property right known as an easement. So you would first check, can an easement be legal or can it only ever be equitable? And if easements can be legal, 
is this particular easement legal or equitable? So the first issue we're going to look at is whether this type of property right is capable of being legal. Because if it isn't, then it's equitable. So we need to look in section 1 of the Law of Property Act 1925, which tells us which rights are capable of being legal. And at the risk of repeating myself, remember that just because a right is capable of being legal doesn't mean that the one that you're dealing with actually is. So section 1 sets out which property rights are capable of being legal and section 1 subsection 1 deals with estates and section 1 subsection 2 deals with interests. So in order to know which subsection we need to be dealing with we need to know the difference between an estate and interest. So let's just have a quick look about the nature of property rights in land and terminology. So an estate is a form of ownership in the land. An estate gives the person the right to occupy the land, receive any income from it and transfer ownership to somebody else. So they can give it away or they can sell it. So for example, a lease is an estate as it gives the owner of the estate the right to occupy the land. But a right of way over your neighbour's land is an interest. So here is the text of section 1.1 and it refers to estates which are capable of being conveyed, that means transferred or created, at law, that means legal. And there are two estates which are capable of being legal. The first is an estate in fee simple absolute in possession, which is a freehold. And the other is a term of years absolute, which is a leasehold or simply a lease. And just note for now that a term of years absolute refers to a fixed term lease. So a lease for a year or five years or 21 years, for example. But it also includes what's known as periodic leases which is the type of lease which just keeps rolling on every week or every month or every year, whatever the relevant period is. Now that may seem a little strange if you're just starting to study land law, but for now you're just going to have to trust me on that one. So here's section 1, subsection 2. And the first thing to notice is that I have removed section 1, 2D because it is very rarely encountered in practice. So section 12a refers to easements, rights or privileges over land for an interest equivalent to an estate in fee simple absolute in possession or a term of years absolute. Subsection b refers to a rent charge. Subsection c refers to a charge by way of a legal mortgage. And subsection e refers to rights of entry which is a right of entry for a landlord under a lease. Now don't worry if these terms are new to you. As your studies progress, you'll study them in more detail and you'll become much more familiar with them. But there is one thing to note, which is that the duration of the right can be important. For example, an easement must be for a term equivalent to a fee simple absolute in possession. In other words, it must last forever or for a fixed term, so for a fixed period. Moving on to section 1, subsection 3, what that tells us is that if the estate or interest that you're dealing with isn't in either subsections 1 or 2, then it's equitable. So these are the property rights which can never be legal. So here's a summary of what we've seen so far. The first issue we need to ask ourselves is whether this type of property right is capable of being legal. So we look to see whether it's listed in section 1.1 or section 1.2. If the answer to that one is yes, then the next stage that we're going to consider is whether this particular one is, is legal. But if the right isn't in either section 1.1 or section 1.2, then it can only ever be equitable. So moving on to the second issue, 
we need to ask what are the formalities required to create this type of legal right and have those formalities been complied with. And formalities simply means legal requirements and we have to check to see whether they've been complied with, so whether they've been followed in this particular case. And we find the rule for this in section 52 of the Law of Property Act 1925, which tells us that in most cases you need a deed. But note the word most here, because like all rules, this one has some exceptions. So we've just seen that we need a deed in most cases. So what are the requirements for a valid deed? Well, the requirements are set out in the Law of Property Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1989, Section 1. And it tells us that the document must be signed and the signatures must be witnessed by a third party. The document must state that it's a deed. So I've put a couple of examples of how this might be done on the slide there for you. And then finally, the document must be delivered. And in reality, this tends to mean when it's dated. And if a written document doesn't comply with all those requirements, then it's not a deed. Now, as I just mentioned, there are some exceptions to the requirements for a deed. And the most important ones that you'll come across are short leases of three years or less. So if you have a tenancy, which is a lease of your student accommodation, and you don't remember having your signature witnessed when you signed it, don't worry, it will fall within this exception. So if it's a short lease, it will be legal even if you didn't sign a deed. And the next one is easements created by necessity, implication or prescription, which is long use. If you're just starting to study land law, don't worry about that too much. I'm sure that you'll come across it as your studies progress. But if you're watching this to um, consolidate or revise, then note that these types of easements are always legal. This is where we've got to now and we have added in the second issue. So we've seen that if a right is capable of being legal, the next thing we need to look at is whether there has been compliance with any legal requirements for its creation. And what we can say is that if the requirements have been complied with, then this particular right is going to be legal. But if not, then it can only be equitable. So we've just seen how legal rights are created. Now let's turn our attention to equitable rights to see how they are created. And as we will see, as a general rule, equitable rights are easier to create because they don't require a deed. So there's less formality required. I've listed all the ways in which equitable rights can be created. That list looks a bit scary, but it isn't really that bad. So let's break it down and look at each one in turn. The first one is by the grant of a right which can only exist in equity. And this is, in effect, what we've just been looking at. So we've seen that there are some rights which are not capable of being legal. So if it's not one of the rights listed in section 1.1 or section 1.2, then it simply can't be legal. Moving on to the second one, a contract to create or transfer rights in land. Now, to understand this, I just need to briefly explain to you the process for transferring ownership of land or creating um, a new property right in land. And this is usually done in two stages, which are exchange of contracts followed by completion. And it's only at the second stage, completion, where the estate is actually transferred to the new owner or the new interest is granted. So the first stage is that there's an agreement or contract between the parties, and it's at this point that both sides are committed to going through with the transaction. So each party has the right to enforce the contract. And for our purposes, the importance of that is that this right gives you a proprietary right, 
known as an estate contract. So that right to enforce the contract creates an equitable right in the land. So, for example, a contract to create a lease creates an equitable lease. And this is what happened in the case of Walsh and Longsdale. And it is worth remembering the name of that case. In Walsh and Longsdale, the parties had made a valid contract for a seven-year lease and the tenants moved into the property, but they simply forgot to execute a valid deed which of course they needed in order to have a valid legal lease. However, the courts held that the contract created an equitable lease. So in the second one, we've just seen that a contract can create an equitable right, but Walsh and Longsdale was decided in 1882. So something that we also have to consider is whether the current formalities to create a valid contract in relation to land have been satisfied. As you probably know, a contract can be created very easily. So when you go into a shop and buy some new headphones, for example, that creates a contract. There's nothing in writing. It's just a straightforward sale. But contracts in relation to land are different. There are additional requirements besides the usual offer acceptance, consideration, etc., which need to be complied with. These requirements affect all contracts created after 1989. And the requirements are set out in Section 2 of the Law of Property Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1989. And essentially, it states that in order for the contract to be valid, it must be in writing and signed by the parties. But note that their signatures don't have to be witnessed. So here's a simple example. Piers agrees to sell his house to Jim, and the contract stage is where both parties are committed to the transaction. For our purposes, the most important thing is that that contract creates an equitable property right known as an estate contract. Then if all goes to plan, the transaction is completed where peers will execute a deed transferring ownership of his house to Jim. And it's at that point that the legal title to the freehold estate will be transferred to Jim. So here's another example for you, slightly more unusual. Farmer Wilson agrees to grant an easement for £20,000 to the West Country Bank and its successors in title, to lay drains and the right of passage of water under his land to connect the drains from the bank's new head offices to the main sewer. And this agreement is signed by both the parties, but it's not a deed. So this is a contract to create a new easement. So Farmer Wilson is going to grant a new easement to the West Country Bank. And the significance of it being for the bank and its successes in title means that this right is going to be enjoyed by all future owners of the land as well. So it's going to last forever, which means that it's the type of easement which is capable of being legal under Section 1, Subsection 2. And what the case of Walsh and Longsdale tells us is that so long as the contract is valid, it creates an equitable easement. And because we know that the agreement is in writing and they've both signed it, then it does satisfy the requirements for a valid contract under Section 2 of the Law of Property Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1989. And of course, if they then go on to complete the transaction, By using a deed, the bank will acquire a new legal easement. So back to our flowchart, we're still on the left-hand side because this easement is capable of being legal. But what we've just seen is that the requirements to create a legal easement haven't been complied with, so it's an equitable easement. Moving on to the next one, an attempt is made to create a legal right which does not follow the correct formalities. So just consider this example. 
Laura and Tara decide that Laura will grant a lease to Tara of a shop that she owns. And the lease is going to be for 20 years. As we know, a lease is capable of being legal because it's, it's in section 11. But because it's a long lease, it needs to be created by a deed. But the document that Laura and Tara sign isn't a deed. So perhaps they didn't have their signatures witnessed or perhaps it doesn't actually state that it's intended to be a deed. So I refer to this situation as where a deed went wrong. So the parties think that they've executed a deed, they think that they've created a legal lease, but they haven't actually done it because they haven't followed the correct formalities. But the courts have decided that the document could be treated as a contract to create a lease as long as it satisfies all the requirements of a valid contract. So if we look to see whether the document that Laura and Tara have signed, whether it satisfies the requirements of section 2, and it does because it's in writing and they both signed it. And here's a tip for you if um, you're in the exam facing this situation. As we've seen, a deed has to be in writing and it must be signed. Now there are other requirements too, but you'd be pretty hopeless not to at least put it in writing and sign it. So in most exam questions, your faulty deed will satisfy the requirements for a valid contract in relation to land, because you'd usually have something in writing which the parties have signed. And the situation I've just been describing is what happened in the case of Parker and Taswell. Going back to our flowchart, we're still down the left-hand side in green. There hasn't been compliance with the legal requirements for its creation, so it is equitable. And the difference between the second example in Walsh and Longsdale is that in that case, the parties deliberately entered into a contract for a lease. They just simply forgot to execute a deed. But in Parker and Taswell, the example that we've just been looking at, the parties attempted to execute a deed but got it wrong. So as we've just seen, sometimes in an exam it's going to be important to decide whether you've got a deed or whether you've got a contract. So what I've done on this slide is just to give you a quick a memoir on the differences between the formalities required for a valid deed and the formalities required for a valid contract. And what you'll see is that the key difference is that for a valid deed, the signatures must be witnessed and the document must state that it's intended to be a deed. So in an exam, if an examiner wants you to spot a faulty deed, the most obvious way for an examiner to do this is to either state that the signatures weren't witnessed or there's nothing to suggest that the document states that it is a deed. So just watch out for that. And I'm going to deal with the following three fairly quickly um, because you will come across these when you study equity and trust and you will come across them as you study land law as well. And to go into too much detail here I think would be too confusing. So um, the first one on the slide there is if the person who grants the right only has an equitable right themselves. So you can't give what you haven't got. So if the estate that the property owner has is only equitable, then any rights that he or she attempts to create or transfer can also only ever be equitable. Um, the next one is if you create a trust over your land. Um, you can create a trust without a deed, but what you'll see when you study um, equity and trust is that it does need to be evidence in writing and signed. And finally, you'll probably come across these in your studies of land law uh, as well as in trust. Property rights can arise under the common law by conduct, which are equitable. And the most important ones for our purposes are 
um, trusts over land which are either constructive trusts or resulting trusts. They don't require evidence in writing uh, which is signed, so it's an exception to the general rule that we saw above, and rights arising by proprietary estoppel. And the last one is where the formalities in relation to land registration haven't been complied with. This one will become clearer after you've studied how estates and interests are dealt with in relation to registered land. But the thing to note for now is that sometimes the registration process must be completed before these rights can become legal. So, for example, if you grant a lease to somebody by deed for 15 years, as we know, that would ordinarily create a legal lease. But if title to the land is registered, then that lease will remain equitable until you have completed the registration process. So back to our flowchart, I've added this on. So there are some types of rights and estates which can only be completed and uh, become legal when the registration requirements have been completed. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this video helpful and that you've picked up some tips along the way. And remember that if you're new to land law and you've made it through to the end, you might find it helpful to watch the video again when you've completed your studies and you're revising for an end of year assessment. Please consider subscribing to my channel or like or share because it really does make a difference. And I will be adding more content soon. Please feel free to add comments below because I find them really useful. Thanks again for watching. Good luck with your studies.